message this morning is um, entitled Wild Honey. Wild Honey. And it comes from this passage that I read to you in a, a bit of an animated way there for the call to worship. As we look at Matthew chapter 3, it talks about John the Baptist and about his particular or even call it peculiar ministry. I just want to begin reading from verse 1 and then I'm going to stop just as we get down here a bit. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, I won't say it out in an animated way the way I did before, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, verse four, this is our text. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Just stop there for a moment. I started looking at this passage when I felt the Lord was directing me to speak about it and uh, started thinking about the various different things. In fact, I tried to come up with what Preachers would call a homiletical outline. You know, I tried to come up with three points in a poem or something, you know, that would sound a bit like a, like a, uh, a proper sermon would, and I, I couldn't do it. But at the same time, there were certain highlights, certain things about this that really stuck out to me. And consequently, I believe the Lord really was able to just show me things. Have you ever been on a walk with somebody and maybe... In my case, it was apparent because my dad was brilliant at taking me on walks. And we used to go into the wood. And as you do, as you go with somebody, um, they begin pointing different things out. Do you know how it is? Sometimes it's, you know, the foliage. Sometimes it's the, the lack of noise. Sometimes it's an animal or, oh, did you see this? Or, or then there's the reflection on a story of the past. And, and it just goes all over the place. You know, it doesn't have to follow a particular theme. It just is because you're walking with them. And I felt as if when I was, when I was reading this passage through, I just had, I was just walking with the Lord and he was just mentioning all of these various different things to me. And some of them I found rather humorous. If you ever visited me in my, uh, in my study, some of you would think I was crazy, you know, because I usually keep the door closed so no one will hear me, you know, because there are times when I'm reading along and suddenly I burst out laughing for no reason, you know, and if somebody was there, they'd really... In fact, I, I used to, this is a true story, but when I was in television, I used to share an office um, for a short period of time with a few members of staff. And uh, they were very normal people, you know. <laughs> they, were, they would sit there and get on with their work. Whereas with me, I would talk to myself, and sometimes I'd talk to them, even though I, they knew they weren't listening. Other times I would comment out loud about the things that I was doing. And so I had this way about me, and it wasn't until I got my own office again that I realized, they probably think I'm crazy, you know. <laughs> That's just how I came up with it. But there were a few things about this that really stuck out to me, and I just want to share some of them with you. Maybe one of them will mean something to you. Maybe none of them will. I don't know. But uh, the first thing was, when I looked at this, especially verse 4, John's clothes, made of camel's hair, had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. And I thought, what does this say about John? The dude is weird. You, you know, as, as I started reading this, I thought, John the Baptist is a very strange character. In fact, if you think of it, here's Matthew who's writing this, or, you know, certainly the, the, uh, the tax collector Matthew is one of his disciples, and you're reading this through and you think, this is something that was observed, something that stuck out about the character of who John the Baptist was. And it's not every time that you would have. If, if I were to mention to you, let's say you went on holiday and you visited a church, and I said to you, what did you think of the church? Well, you would give me this summation of what it was like, but very few of you would say, the pastor wore camel's hair. He <laughs> ate locusts. And what, do you know what I see? Can you see this kind of thing? Who, this is a preacher we're talking about here. 
And, you know, as, as pictures portray him, we don't know that this is the case, whether he actually stood in the water, but I think all the paintings have John preaching while he's standing down in the water talking to people who are gathered along the shore. But something about the character really stuck out. He obviously didn't care what people thought about him. He had on a, you know, a, a, a camel's hair garment tied with a leather belt, strange diet. He didn't care what people thought about him. So we can't say really that he was on the cutting edge of fashion and diet. <laughs> you wouldn't consider this kind of character to be somebody that everybody would say, oh, it's the latest craze, you know, camel's hair. And oh, have you tried locusts? And they're so good with wild honey. Have you, you know, there's just these kinds of things that you obviously note are not part of this particular person's character. He didn't obviously live to eat. You know, it's interesting, when I was uh, living in Texas, there was uh, several members of my staff who uh, were on diet programs. And part of the diet program, and I may have shared this before, but part of the diet program they were on not only provided the food that would help them lose the weight, it also pro pro provided counseling to help them get a different mindset so that they would approach food differently. And maybe these programs that are around here do the same, but this was you know, my experience at the time. And I'll never forget when they came back from one of these meetings and they kept chatting about the fact that they were drilling into their mind that we are not supposed to live to eat. We're supposed to eat to live. And, you know, how many in our culture, you know, say, I just live from one meal to the next. And they, they plot out their, you know, very elegant looking diets of what they're going to have. And I don't mean the people who are just losing weight. I'm pe talking about people who really like their food. They like gourmet food. They go through the restaurant and it's not the same thing. It's not what's the special. It's not what's cheap. It's what looks good. What looks exotic? What looks like something that I might like to try? And then, of course, you get those who are craning their necks looking at what other people have. What, oh, what's that? You know, because they like the appearance of it and the presentation. And, you know, I've, I've never quite got my head... David, you go out to eat, so maybe you've had these kind of experiences. I've never got my head around how, why the, you know, the chef, once he'll finish this nice-looking meal, will, will they take this brown looking sauce, I call it brown sauce, I know it's not, you know, and then they kind of dribble it, or no, they'll say drizzle, you know, and they'll put it across the top, and, and then they'll put a little bit of cress at the corner, or some other green thing, you know, and, and then they look at it, and it has to look a certain way, do you know, have you ever eaten in one of those places? I haven't, <laughs> no, but obviously, when it comes to John the Baptist, he was eating to stay alive, basically. And he was eating what we would have called convenience food. Yeah. Locusts, they were everywhere. Why not eat them? <laughs> I, it was obviously a bloke as well, you know, but you have locusts. And wild honey. Listen to the wild honey aspect. I've titled the message this. I'm not going to stay a long time on this point. But do you remember in the scripture where God... Uh, well, actually, it was the um, the spies who came back and gave the testimony of the fact that the land that God had promised them was a land that flowed with milk and honey. Do you remember that? And do you remember you re read that repetitively through the scripture, a land that flowed with milk and honey? And, and some of you, if you're like me, might be a bit curious as to why that description would be meaningful. And I didn't look up about the milk, that didn't apply to the message, but I did about the honey. I thought, why did they say that? Because there, were, there was actually so much honey in the land that it dripped off of the leaves of the trees. You could literally find places where it flowed. It just, it, it, probably not in a steady stream, but there'd be times you couldn't actually stand under a tree because drips would come down and it was honey because it just, there was so abundant. The bees would be producing this to such an extent, which also was testimony to the fact that the, the land was very fertile. 
It grew an abundance of different plants and things, which made it very good for animals to thrive upon and to be able to produce. And so the, the honey dripping from leaves, it was readily available. So if you apply that to the case of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, almost anywhere he'd reach, he could find food. He could find, he didn't have to go far from the wilderness in which he was living to be able to find locusts and wild honey, and that would, would be sustenance. It would keep him alive to be able to continue to preach. Which brings me to the next point. His calling, why he was there, was more important to him than his diet. Now that's a, a big point made in a small one. John the Baptist was more focused upon what it is that he was supposed to do than he was about the little things about, like, where am I going to eat? We live in a culture. We live in a society. Uh, our friends, maybe you and I, would spend a lot of time worrying about those kinds of insignificant things. When you got up in the morning, you know, you begin looking at what it is that I'm going to have for breakfast. But then when I get finished with church, what will I have for lunch? And then, oh, do I need to take something out the freezer or do I get, need to get something ready for dinner? And then what about tomorrow and the next day? And what about this week? Some of you plan your menu for the whole week on the weekends and you begin looking at all that kind of stuff. John the Baptist was the kind of person whose focus was such that he had to remind himself that he needed to eat. And then it was whatever he could get his hands on, and this was what was convenient. You know, locusts and wild honey, it was there. Now the Bible doesn't say, I haven't researched it, and this is one of those things that I'm almost afraid to research. I almost don't want to know. I don't know whether he cooked the locust. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm just going to make that statement and I'll move on. I don't know. It doesn't say, I don't want to know, you know. But it would be the kind of character that John the Baptist was that he would, he would find just what he could because what his work was was more important than the rest. Do you know, I think that's part of our problem today when it comes to our own physical being. We spend a lot of time worrying about that kind of stuff and not enough time in doing things that would distract us from those things, from needing those things. I think that's probably why a lot of us put on weight is because we're not active enough and we're not doing enough because there have been times, certainly in my own life, and I can only use myself, but there have been times in my life when I was so busy, I was losing weight, and when I got a meal, if I could squeeze a meal in, it was great, but I was really excited about getting back to doing the thing, getting back to doing the work, and the food took a back seat. Have we become a culture that focuses so much on food that we're looking from meal to meal that we're not doing enough? We're not active enough. I thought, maybe we need to get back to the mindset that says, instead of worrying about all of those specific things, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on more toes when I say this. I have a lot of friends, I'm sure you have some, maybe you are one, um, who emphasize healthy eating. And I'm not preaching against healthy eating by any means, but it does cross my mind that some of our healthy eating makes us unhealthy because we're more interested in eating quality things that we're not active enough. You know, I, I look back across my childhood and I look at my childhood friends and, of course, we were of a generation which was more active than they are now. We didn't, you know, we had television, and even in America, of course, we probably had more of it than you did. I don't know. But we didn't have all that many channels. <laughs> Some of you are old enough to remember how, when there were only just two or three channels at the most, you know, and sometimes you'd live in an area where you couldn't get all of them, you know. <laughs> that was the way we were, you know. And, and then the television programs, there was a time for children and a time for adults. And then movies. I still love this. You know, you could watch a movie on television. It would come out once a week. 
There was the one day a week there was a movie on television and you knew just about everybody was going to watch the movie this week. This is what it was. And, uh, you know, those days and, and produced more activity amongst kids. Kids were just more active. But if you looked at our diets back in those days, I sometimes, I, I still have cravings for some of the food that I used to have as a kid. I used to go to a high school where they sold donuts to us in high school. Oh, it was, can you imagine? And varieties. And I remember they would display them the way that donuts need to be displayed, you know, at the right angle so you could see all of them, not just the one in front. And you didn't have to look through the glass. They were all so you could just look at them. And, uh, and I had favorites, and I went through the periods of time. But one of them was these, what they called chocolate long johns, you know. It's a great big old long donut like this. Big old. See, I'm starting to go back to my American language now. And it, and it, had, it had frosting across the top. It had icing. But it wasn't skimpy. It, it kind of ran over the edges, you know, not like they do now where they kind of fit it in so that they can say that it's got icing on it. I mean, this was just, and, and I don't know and don't want to know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably fried that donut in deep fry before they put those drippings on it. And it was always very moist. And I don't think that was probably distilled water, you know, it was probably, you know, deep fried. So I don't think, looking back, that our diet was all that good, you know. Things have increased in quality through the years. So why was it we were so thin? Because we were so active. We were always going. In fact, when we'd come in and we would eat, we would grab what we could that would fill us in order for us to be able to hurry but get back outside. Do you know? That's what happened. And I started reading through this and started reviewing and thinking about all the things in life. And I started saying, you know, it's very interesting that John the Baptist was more interested in his preaching and in doing what God wanted him to do than he was about his diet. He was just eating whatever he could get his hands on to put food into his mouth so he could get on doing the work. Spent more time on that than I expected I would. But I was thinking about those long johns probably as what was distracting. But also, if you think about it, for some reason, his dress and his diet got, mess got noticed. Not just his message. People noticed what he was wearing. And I started thinking about that. Jesus pulls it out. And you don't have to turn for the sake of time. I'll quote these verses, but if you want to write them down and look at them, Matthew chapter 11, verse 8, and Luke chapter 7, verse 25. This is those, th these are those passages where Jesus brings up John the Baptist to the Pharisees, and he says to him, what went you out for to see when you went to look at John the Baptist? What was it that caused you to want to go and hear what he had to say? And then Jesus pulls out his attire and he says, did you go out to see a king, you know, dressed in robes? Is that what you were expecting when you went out to see John the Baptist? And he said, no, because kings are in palaces and, and you know, on thrones. They're not out in the wilderness. So then he calls attention again. So what did you go to see? What was it that drew you to go see John the Baptist? If I were to say to you today, oh, folks, down in Lee Valley Park, there's a guy out there today. I mean, he's, he's dressed in the strangest clothes. He's eating the weirdest food. You've got to see him. You know, we probably wouldn't make a beeline to go out there to go, to go see what it is. It would, but if I told you this guy's message, what it is that he has to say, made me also wonder, did, was God giving the scoffers of the day an excuse not to take any notice of what it was that he had to say. We live in a society, we live in a world today where appearances are very important. In fact, didn't you have a British TV series, Keeping Up Appearances, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, because the way people look and act, and in some cases the way they talk, are all <laughs> extremely important to our 
world, to our society, certainly to the culture of, of where we live. And if a person doesn't look the part, doesn't have all of those little ingredients, then some of us might say, I'm not going to take any notice of them. I've had a lot of people through the years who've said to me, John, you know, you are a minister. You need to wear a dog collar. Do you know? No, no, this is just, you know, and especially if you go to the hospital or you go someplace, you need the respect that comes along with wearing the dog collar. And, and I said, no, no. You, you won't. I, it, it's a hang up I have. So it's one of my many faults. I won't say few. But I say, no, I'm not going to wear a dog collar. I'm just not. It's not me. It's never been me. I was actually brought up in a kind of church that didn't like dog collars. Didn't like dogs, probably. <laughs> but um, I'm not going to do that. If that was what was required to do the work, I might have an issue. I might say, no, I, then you have to get somebody else because that's, that's just not me. That's not me. This last week, Bethany said it, I was spent a little bit of time down at the police station, and some of you will know that I have been appointed uh, as Broxbourne's um, police constabulary, Hertfordshire police constabulary's uh, chaplain for Broxbourne. And uh, it's a privilege, it's a real honor. And uh, I had to get vetted, you know, they had to go back and check out the doctor who delivered me to make sure he was okay. <laughs> <laughs> They really go deep with these things, and they have all of the, you know, the checks and things to be able to do it. But then, once you have been vetted, and once you have all of those, you know, they know you're okay. Wow, you know, you're welcomed in. I mean, you've passed all of these points, and they will open up to you, and they will show you, and they will talk openly the way they would to one another. And I consider that a huge honor to be able to have that kind of rapport. And I hope it builds. I trust the Lord's going to be able to use me in some ways, and I'll be spending more time with them and hopefully be available to them. And this isn't a chaplaincy role that's for people as much as it is for the police, which is very interesting. I'm there for them. And uh, I'm there when they go out, and I heard of a case recently of some that they went on the scene of something that was horrendous, and, of course, they maintained face while they were out there. But when they came back, there were several of the officers who just head and hands were bawling their eyes out because of what they'd seen. Those are the sides of things you don't see. And those are the sides where it will become important Sorry, for me you know, to be able to be there or to be of help if they need or want to talk to somebody. But I started looking at all that and I thought, you know, we're very big on appearances. And sometimes... When, when you get introduced, as I found the chief inspector introducing me as, you know, this is Reverend John R. Green, and of course, what do I do? It just John, you know, I'm just John, and I, you know, I'm not heavy on the revy. So I've always said, you know, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to, you don't have to emphasize the reverend bit, you know, that's fine, I'm just John. And uh, in fact, I've told you this before, but we had three, now one of them's gone, but uh, the, the Catholic Church priest at St. Joseph's is, is Father John. And, of course, John Williams at St. Mary's was Father John. And so they came to me and I said, I'm just John. <laughs> <laughs> just John. Uh, don't, so they, then they started calling me just John. No, no, that's not what I meant. <sighs> but we are big on that type of thing. Instead, though, if you look at it, is that not sometimes an excuse? Was God actually giving the Pharisees an excuse? If you don't want to listen to somebody and what they have to say because of what they wear, then don't go listen to him. Stand on the sidelines, scoff at him, make fun of him if you wish. But if you also listen, common people got past all of that weirdness. They got past all of that while the pharisaical people couldn't, and the common people of the day heard the message that John presented and took heed to it and did what he had to say. He did what he, and, and many of them were baptized because they wanted to prepare, because they listened to what he said, and they got past his clothing and his diet 
and all of those things to listen to what it was he had to say. It also made me wonder, I wonder if any of them were actually clever enough that they thought, you know, maybe he's eating locusts and wild honey and wearing those clothes because that's not what's important and he's doing as I've expressed to you. He's just eating to stay alive because he's emphasizing this message because of how important it is, because of how we really need to listen to what it was that he had to say. Ultimately, listen to this, ultimately his message was haunting. It was haunting. I want you to look with me and at chapter 11. If you're still in Matthew chapter 3, turn over a few pages and look with me at Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 14. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14. Hopefully, unlike a few weeks ago, I'll have my reference correct here. Yes, I do. Okay. Matthew chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 1. Start there. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That's why these miracle powers are at work in him. Now, just stop there for a minute. Why was Herod so upset if this was John the Baptist come back to life? Because if you read the rest of the passage here, and it goes down to verse 11, you can see the story. Because it was Herod who actually ended up having John beheaded in prison for the sake of his dancing daughter, you know. And it ended up being that he was responsible. So why was it, especially in this day and age, Remember, you can't judge history the way we do today. You have to look at it in its context. And back in those days, life meant a little less, and especially to a king. A king could behead you, and, and it was nothing. Do you know what I mean? And if a king wanted to take somebody off the street and then chop off their head and give their head to his daughter, I mean, all of that stuff wouldn't happen today. But he did it then. And if that happened, do you think they would bat an eye at the memory of John the Baptist? Would they spend any time thinking about it? Or would they not just say, John the Baptist, he's he gone, he's dead. That's over. That's behind, that's history. That's what, you know, we'd look. But he was concerned. And if you look at this, and again, I look at things in a more animated way. Those of you that have gotten to know me know I do that. But if you look at verse 1, where Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus. Look at the expression on Herod's face. He's listening intently as these things are being told. And then when it is told, what's he do? I can see this. I'd get one of you up for an illustration. Um, Simon, will you play along with me? Would you come up here for a second? Sorry, I wouldn't embarrass anybody like this. I have to pick one of our leadership team for it. But, you know, here he is. He's listening intently. Stand here close enough. And he, he does this, and then he says, it's, it's John the Baptist. It's, he's come back from the dead. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, can you see the anxiety? Can you see this kind of fretting where he's like, oh, no, you know, the wheels of his brain are turning as he's listening to the miracles that Jesus is performing, he's thinking back to this weird dude who wore the camel hair and ate the locusts and wild honey he was out there, and then how that he was preaching this message and what it was that he was preaching, and then I put him in prison. Yeah, that made everybody happy, and it was all good, but he said a few things to me, and it bothered me because actually I knew what he told me. Again, you have to get the context of verses 1 to 11. What he told me was right, I shouldn't have married my brother's wife. He's right. And he was bold enough to tell me. And nobody talks to a king that way. And of course, beheaded later and all the rest of it. <gasps> he's back. Oh no, he's back. When I made the point, ultimately John's message was haunting. It was haunting. What was happening was that the message hadn't died with the person. The message hadn't died with the person. I tell people that when I preach. There are times when I'll say, you know, there'll be a day when I talk about the gospel and I talk about the importance of receiving the Lord as your Savior. And I talk about how that if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not going to make it into heaven. 
even if you're good, even if you've done all these things that you say are important, God's not going to go, oh, well, here's your good works and your bad works. And oh, looky there, your good works outweigh your bad works. You're in. He doesn't do that. That's man's creation. Actually, he looks and says, Jesus, where's Jesus? He that has the son has life. He that has not the son of God has not life. So where's Jesus in your life? He does this. And then there is that message. And then people will say, oh, that's just that preacher. I know I've been to that church. I've heard that message. Yeah, I know about that. And I'll just do this. See, I won't go back there. Because if I don't go back to that church, I won't have to hear that preacher say that message. I can go someplace where they say nice things. And, you know, where they, we speak correctly. Without a southern drawl, you know, and when they speak correctly and they do things the way we do things here. And, you know, they don't look weird and they do look like they belong, you know. They say those things, but then the message is haunting. The Lord, the Holy Spirit places upon the hearts of those people that thing and they can't seem to shake it. They can't seem to get away from it. He that, I remember what he said. You know, it just keeps coming back to me. I remember what he said. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. And I don't have the Son. Well, that means I don't have life. And they can't get away from the message because it's haunting. I thought, wow, it's testimony to the fact that sometimes we just have to listen to what God has to say. But also, and this was my point previously, sometimes God gives you an excuse. If you want an excuse, there are loads of them. If you want an excuse, and I, I don't see any visitors to say I think we'll have this issue, but if you wanted an excuse to leave out the door and never come back and say why you won't, you could say, well... The music was too loud, you know. The pastor didn't wear a robe. The message, I mean, he didn't even use the king's English. By the way, I would if I could, but, he, you know, he used one of those, you know, ones that don't sound holy. And then the way that he spoke, I mean, he, he moved. You're not supposed to do that. And in a church, you're supposed to stay still, you know, and... Now, all of these things. What would they have said then? He wore camel's hair with a leather belt. And he ate locusts and wild honey. You know. Do you know? Do you want an excuse? Sometimes God says, if you want one, I'll give it to you. He's an American. <laughs> That's the best excuse you could come up with. I mean, what do you expect? You know. If you want an excuse, God can give it to you. But on the other hand, if you have somebody who's there who says, Yeah, but what did he say? What did he say? And was it right? It's haunting. I believe as we look at this passage, you know, it's not necessarily just about wild honey. It's about being able to say the most important things God laid out for the people to be able to hear. And there were many people who did, who received John's baptism and who looked forward to when Jesus would come. Why did they look forward to him? Because John said, as he was baptizing us, he told us, there's coming another one who's mightier than I am. Listen to him. Where is that guy? And they were waiting, waiting for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just a few things to share. Let's go to the Lord, shall we? <coughs>